second in the series of our anniversary series messages. Uh, you know that our theme is Be Joyful in Hope, Patient in, in Affliction, Faithful in Prayer, and it comes from Romans 12:12. 12, 12. Last week we looked at being joyful in hope, and we saw what it meant. It wasn't a, I hope so, but it is a no-so and it's based on what Jesus has already done for us. And so we can have hope. It's, it's not a, a blind stepping into the, the, the dark, but there is a foundation for hope. As I've been preparing in this series, even for myself, and I've studied the Word of God a long time, it has, been, it has come back to my heart again and again what a foundation God gives us for the... the the Christian walk to which he calls us. You know, each one of us, we walk, God calls us to walk and we're going forward and there are things that we don't understand and there are things that are hard for us and there are things that we struggle with and we think, well, God, you want me to do that, but it's so hard. But as we are seeing, as we saw last week and as I'm seeing more and more and we're gonna see again this week, God never just wants us to shoot into the dark. I, I, I don't believe in blind faith. I don't even believe in blind obedience. God always gives us something to stand on. There's always something there. And we saw that last week as we looked at the being joyful in hope, that we can hope because He's already done something for us. And because of that, then uh, we can grab onto these things and we can hold on and wait for the Lord to fulfill this, uh, to fulfill the hope that He has put in our hearts. We don't work it up ourselves. We don't try to make it happen. It comes from God. It is fulfilled by God. Amen? Amen. amen. Thank you for the two who said amen. It's true. So, Be Joyful in Hope was last week. Um, at the end of the series, I'm going to, for those who would like, uh, several of you have, have said, I'd like the notes, I'd like the scriptures. Uh, if you'll be patient with me, I patient, patient in affliction, at the end of this, I'll give you a whole handout, then all of it together, so you can do some more studying on your own. And today, it is Be Patient in Affliction. Ah, Be Joyful in Hope was easier, right? Today we're going to be patient in affliction, but frankly, I believe this is one that we really need, that many of us really need. So we're going to look at this one today, this week, patient in affliction. And I want us to come to this the same way we did with being joyful in hope. Because if we can, if we have our own idea about what it means to be patient, because some of you come from Buddhist backgrounds, and this whole idea of patience and just waiting and enduring is a very strong idea in Buddhism as well. We'll talk about that in just a minute. Well, so is that what it means when we come to the Word of God? We need to understand what God means when He tells us, be patient in affliction. We need to understand what affliction means. Because some of, some of us this morning discount ourselves from this because we think, well, I'm not being persecuted because, because I'm a Christian, so I, I guess this doesn't include me. Well, what does the Bible say? What, affli what is affliction? What is being patient? And so we're going to see. We always need a foundation of truth. So um, let me back up just a minute. So as we look at this, what does it mean? Uh, what does it mean to be, uh, to be patient in affliction? So some of us think it means, okay, I'm a Christian I'm, I'm, and I'm in a world or I'm in a workplace or I'm in a family where people are not Christians and I'm being persecuted because I'm righteousness. This is what affliction is. That is what affliction is, but it's not the only thing that affliction is when it comes to the Word of God. And you're going to be encouraged this morning as we look at this because you're going to see that you are included in this passage. Every one of us this morning. The word affliction here means literally or figuratively pressure. Now there are other words for affliction, but the word here is literally, it means pressure or a burden. So it's something that you feel. It's something that you feel. And in, our, in your various Bible translations, here are the words that you'll find. You'll find affliction, anguish, burdened, persecution, suffering, tribulation, trouble, and trial. These are words that will, that will fit with this. So that starts to enlarge our view already. Um, so if trouble is coming to you specifically because you are living as a Christian righteously in an unrighteous situation, then you are called to be patient in affliction, and that's aff affliction. I've told you about my great aunt before, uh, the one, uh, Aunt Rhoda, the one who was the one who was instrumental in, uh, in my dad's salvation. 
um, who married um, a man who was not a Christian but who said, I love you, I love you, I love you. She married him at 16. She was a Christian from a Christian family and he was a devil to her for all of her life because she lived a righteous life. And shortly before he, on his deathbed, shortly before he passed away, he accepted the Lord. But my aunt lived with, she was patient with affliction for maybe 65 or 70 years. That's a long time. That's a long time. But she won a reward from it. She won a reward. And we'll talk more about that in just a minute. So if that's what you're going through this morning, that includes you. But included in this is those of you who are parents, some of you have wayward children that are rebellious and far from God or moving away from God. And I want to say to you this morning that you are included in that affliction. That's, that is included in that. Some of you have ongoing financial pressures and they've been going on for a while. You are included in this affliction. All of this, all of this is included. Or there are dreams and desires in your heart, God, and you believe it's from the Lord, but it has not yet come to pass, and you're really struggling with it. That's included in affliction. Um, some of you are dealing with, especially those of you who have chronic health issues, and honestly, after living with Betty for a long time, um, I have such a better appreciation of people who have chronic health issues because you're fighting the good of fi fight of faith and you're trying, but it just it seems to keep on going. And it doesn't help when there are Christians around you that say, well, you just need to, your faith isn't strong enough. That's why, you, that's why you're not yet healed or whatever, as, as some of you have heard already. But if you are dealing with health issues, especially chronic ones or things that go on longer, um, this is included in affliction. Or there are just the troubles that come our way because we live in a world that's a fallen world, okay? And all of us do. All of us do. So all of these things are included. So as these things happen, God says, be patient in them. And as we can see already when we look at this, you know, if something happens quickly and is gone quickly, it's, it's, it's kind of easy, right? I mean, it's no fun, but it's gone and then we keep on going. But how many of us have found that most of the time our afflictions, our pressure, our troubles, and our trials, they just kind of keep on going, don't they? They don't let up. They don't let up. And so God has something to say to us this morning. Um, and he says, be patient in affliction. And some of you say, I know that. <laughs> That's hard. Um, I don't want to do that. I want to give up. Where's God? So we're going to look at God's word this morning. Um, so what does it mean to be patient in this context, in this context of affliction? Does it mean that you just have to grin and bear it? Uh, my least favorite medical visit is the dentist. I'd rather go to almost anybody than a dentist. Would you? How many of you have had work done on your teeth. Maybe you have a cavity or something like that, right? And he starts, he starts drilling. I'm, some of you are, are, are shaking already. He starts drilling and he keeps on and he keeps on and he keeps on and you think, I'm going to bite him. I, I, I bit a dentist one time, I'm sorry to say. He pulled his hand back and said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, but, you know, sometimes at the dentist, and, and the, I think the Holy Spirit brought that example, when you just say, oh, you know, with your mouth open, and you're trying to bear it, right? Is that what it means as a Christian? You're just trying to bear it without biting somebody. Uh, um, is that what it means? I don't, think, I don't think that's what it means. Is it the Buddhist idea? Um, Buddhism has four noble virtues or four noble truths and the first one is uh, suffering existence and life is suffering and pain that's that's the that's the woohoo <laughs> you know um, so is is that the outlook is that the idea um, and I know this is a serious subject and some of you are really are struggling with this and, and I promise you I'm taking it seriously too um, but is that what it means as Christians? We just endure, just, okay, well, that's just the way it is. That's my lot. I don't have any hope. This is how I'm going to have to endure. It isn't. That's not what it means in God's Word. And so we want to understand, as we look at God's Word, what it means. So for the Christian, as you look in your Bibles, you're going to find it translated uh, abide for patience. Abide, endure, patiently endure, be steadfast, persevere, be patient. And so for the Christian, 
the idea then is that there is a steadfastness under pressure, an endurance and a grace in the face of trials. So depending on the Bible translation you have, let me put those two together. Your Bible may say, be patient in trouble, be patient in tribulation, be steadfast and patient in suffering, persevere in your tribulation, be patient when trouble comes, be steadfast in times of trouble, and then the message, don't quit in hard times. So these are some of the translations that you will find. And so when we put it all together, we see that it's not a Buddhist idea, um, but God has a way for us to make it through and how uh, to be patient in our affliction. What I have found for many Christians and for myself as well, when I come to this topic, I have all sorts of ideas and struggles being patient in affliction. Um, some of us think, I'm a Christian, so I shouldn't have troubles, right? Uh, I look online sometimes, there's some, uh, well, I won't go into details. Anyhow, um, and uh, this particular person is always proclaiming victory. And it's great to proclaim victory, but it looks more like you have no troubles. There's this, there's that. And what I have found is it doesn't work that way as a Christian. It, it doesn't. Um, so some of us think I'm a Christian, I shouldn't have troubles. Some of you this morning are feeling guilty because you're going through troubles and you've been going through for a long time and you're blaming yourself and you're saying, if my faith were stronger, I wouldn't be going through this. Some of you are struggling with that this morning and we're gonna see that that's not what the Word of God says. Some of you are thinking, I must have done something wrong so God is punishing me. That's not what the Bible says either. Some of you are saying, if God really loved me, I wouldn't have to go through this. Another lie. Some of us are saying, affliction is bad, it's destroying me. Another lie. Some of us are saying, I can't make it, it's too hard for me. The devil will tell you that, but it's a lie. You can make it. And then some of us this morning, especially if we've been going through trouble for a long time, we are beginning to feel isolated and alone. And we're beginning to feel God doesn't really love me so much. And that's a lie also. Jesus said to his disciples just before he went to the cross, in this world you will have tribulation. Or, and then we know the rest of the verse, but we're going we're gonna to wait on the rest of the verse. You know what the rest of the verse is, right? Take heart! I've overcome the world, but be of good cheer. But we're going to get to that in just a minute. Just look at this part first. So if you've got an argument with this morning, don't come argue with me. Go talk to God about it. Jesus says there will be troubles in this world. And I've given you some other translations of it. You'll have suffering in this world. Here on this earth, you'll have many trials and sorrows. And then after he's gone, James, his half-brother, um, adds insult to injury by saying when troubles and trials of various kinds, so see this covers the things that we're going through, when they come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. So how many of you right now in your troubles are saying, woohoo, thank you Lord, more, 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 I'm so joyful. Because honestly, we look at this, I have struggled with this before. Have you struggled with this verse? Or just I, your pastor, has struggled with this verse. I used to think, how? How can this be? Uh, be uh, counted an opportunity for great joy. Let's look at it and let's see, because this really does, Jesus says, you're going to have troubles in this world. James, his half-brother, much later, says, consider it an opportunity for joy. And so when we come to these things that are hard for us to understand, what we have to do is go back to the Word of God and understand the, rest, the other things that God's Word says. When we go to the Word of God, He gives us answers for these things. He doesn't give us all answers, by the way. So if you are of the sort that you want every single question answered, I am so sorry you will not have every question answered by God because you're not God. Um, but He will answer enough questions and He will let us know enough that when we come to that point and we need to step, we can step. 
when we come as far as, as we can go, and then we've got to go a little bit further, there's something there so we can keep on going further. And so we're going to look at this, consider it an opportunity for joy. Let's start there, and then let's keep on going. So as I said at the beginning, I don't believe in blind faith, and I don't believe in blind obedience. I really don't. I really don't. So James says this, inspired by the Holy Spirit, consider it an opportunity for great joy, and you and I say, how can that be? This is too hard. This is too difficult. He's going to tell us how. So let's look at what comes next. He says, dear brothers and sisters, so we've read this part, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Why? Okay, he gives us something to step on now. Okay, are you facing troubles and trials this morning? Here's a next step for you. Consider it joy. An opportunity for great joy. By the way, let me put a pause on that just a minute. In Lighthouse, we have several accountants, s several people that work with numbers a lot. This word is for you. This word consider in King James is count. And it is specifically an accounting word. It's an accounting word. And what it means is when you're... My translation again is when you're looking at this, you don't put it in the debit column, you put it in the credit column. You don't write it down with red ink, you write it down with black ink. So it's not necessarily, my heart should be overflowing with a lot of emotion, I'm so happy. It's not that. It is that you come to it and we first, you first choose. God, your word says this, so I choose this. We want emotions to come first, and then we follow our emotions so many times, right? Brothers and sisters, if that's how you are living your Christian life, it's going to be tough because our emotions go up and down, in and out, in every which way. We're going to have to choose some things first, and then our emotions become obedient to our choices. And so we consider it, we count it, an opportunity for great joy. So why? Verse 3, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So when trouble comes our way, our faith is tested. Always, always when trouble comes your way. There are tests, God, do you really love me? Am I going to go through this as a Christian trusting in you or am I going to go, to my own go through my own devices? Am I going to depend on people? Am I going to depend on you? Am I going to keep a right attitude as I go through this? Or am I going to get grumpy, angry, afraid, scared, sad, hopeless? All of these things are part of the testing of our faith. And so James says, when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So Jesus has said, be patient in affliction. Affliction comes our way. And James says, count it as a good opportunity. Be joyful about it. Why? Because here is, this, uh, this test is an opportunity for your faith to grow. How does our faith grow? Does my faith grow when I am on the mountaintop and every need is supplied and every problem is solved and every bank account is full, and every cell in my body is healthy, and every relationship is perfect. Do I have any test in those times? There's no test in that. There's no test. Now, there's the test of prosperity. Are we going to continue to walk with the Lord or forget Him? But in effect, there's no test in those things. And so the trouble comes, and our faith is tested, and in that, our endurance has a chance to grow. Why do I want my endurance to grow? Who cares if I have endurance or not? Why can't I just say, okay, well, I'll grow in other areas, but not in endurance? Because when our endurance is fully developed, we will be mature and complete, needing nothing. God works in these situations to grow us up, to mature us. A lot of you in this room are parents this morning, aren't you? Or you have younger brothers and younger sisters, um, and, or you worked with children a lot. How would you feel if a dearly loved child in your own family, 
or in, in your extended family was growing up in other areas, but in one area of, or of his or her life, that child just remained stunted. That child didn't grow, but remained forever a child in that area, incapable, unskilled, unable to do what other healthy children do as they grow. That's a physical example, but there's a spiritual example for us as well, brothers and sisters. And so we go through these things and we can count it joy because God is saying, here's an opportunity for you to grow up. God has a plan for your lives, brothers and sisters. God has things he, want to, he wants to do in you. God has things He wants to do through you. Some of you have callings upon your life and ministries ahead that God has for you. And your heart is stirring. And you know, God, you want me to do this. But brothers and sisters, some of us are not yet ready for those ministries. Some of us cannot yet fulfill those callings. Why? We're not mature enough yet. We haven't grown enough in that area. And God wants us to get to that. And so he says, I'm going to let you go through this, but go through it in the right way. Because we're going to look in just a minute. Sometimes people go through things and they blow it. Blow it. I, I have a favorite Christian author. A lot of people don't know him. His name is Paul Bilheimer. I think he's British. I'm not sure. He's been gone a long time. And he has a small book that I love, and the name of it is Don't Waste Your Troubles. I love it. I love it. Because you see, a lot of us go through troubles and we just, we just waste them. We get out on the other side or maybe the pressure lets up and we're upset and we're angry and we're, we're kind of, hmm, and, well, God, well, I finally got out of that. And it did nothing in us. But God says there's an opportunity here because God wants us to grow. God wants to do something in us and through us. And so James says, let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you'll be perfect and complete, needing nothing. And here it says, let's see, there we go, James 1.12. God, then he goes on further to say, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. For when they've stood the test, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised. So, here is what we step on. You ready? Here's one of the things that we step on. You're going through trouble. I'm going through trouble. It may be what Steve and Rose are going through right now. It may be what some of you are going through. It may not be a health thing. It may be a finance thing. It may be a relationship issue. It may be something else, okay? And God says to you and to me as you go through this, patiently endure. Stick with it. Why? There's a reward at the end of it. But brothers and sisters, for us to receive the full reward that God has for us, and it's a rich reward, it's a full reward, we've got to make it to the end. We've got to make it. If we don't make it to the end, we're not going to receive everything God has for us. Don't you want to receive everything God has for you? I mean, really, everything that God has for you. I do. One of my prayers, and I've told you this before, in recent years, as I have continue to grow in the Lord. One of my prayers has been, Lord, fully fulfill every purpose you have for my life. Do whatever you need to do to get me to that and through that so that you can fulfill everything you have for my life. Don't you want that for your life? Oh, I don't want to get to heaven and stand before God and see what could have been. I want to get to heaven and take my crown which He has given me because I have been faithful, which He has given you because you've been faithful, and we lay it at His feet because He has helped us to remain faithful through suffering. Amen? Amen. 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 And so we go through this. So here's what you step on when God says to you, be patient in your affliction. What do you step on? What do you stand on? What is your foundation? There's a reward for it. Okay? There's a reward for it. Let's go a little bit further. Here's an example for us from Hebrews 10. I love this one. I love this one. The writer of Hebrews, we don't know who it is. It may be Paul. It may be Apollos. Some people think it might be Priscilla. That's the one I'm, that's the one I'm voting for, that it's Priscilla who wrote, but we don't know. Um, he's talking to Jews who have already gone through a hard time, okay? How many of you feel like right now to this point, you've already gone through some really hard things? Wave your hands. Yeah? 
all of us who are honest have just raised our hands, okay? The rest of you bunch of liars, okay? <laughs> we'll pray for you, okay? So, so here we are. And he's talking to people who have already gone through. Look what they've already gone through. Think back on those early days when you first learned about Christ. Remember how you remained faithful even though it meant terrible suffering. You were exposed to public ridicule. You were beaten. Sometimes you helped others who were suffering. You suffered along with those who were thrown into jail. And when all you owned was taken from you. That's a lot of suffering already, right? They've already made it through that. Look at what happens. You accepted it with joy. Aha! James 1, 2, 3, and 4, you knew there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. Here's the reward of patient endurance, right? Okay, that was accounting. Had they yet received the reward? Yes or no? Not yet. So it was an accounting, but accounting is black and white. Is there any if in accounting? No, there's no if in accounting. Accounting is black and white. It will be. And so they could, they knew you, there were better things waiting for you that will last forever. Had they received it yet? Hadn't received it yet. Gone through the suffering. But they could step on that and they could go through the suffering because they knew there was a reward for the suffering. That's one of the ways we go through suffering, brothers and sisters, that there's a reward beyond it. There's something that will come to us. And then the writer to Hebrews says, look at this, I know it's a little bit low, I hope you can see it. So do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Hey, hey, remember last week? Joyful in hope. What are some of the other words for hope? Trust. Confident trust. Here we go. Don't throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. Okay? And then verse 36, patient endurance is what you need when? Now. now. How many of you need patient endurance now? You need it now, right? So remember what you've gone through. And you've already gone through some hard things. And you made it through those hard things. If you made it through those hard things, don't stop now. Keep on going. Keep on going because you will receive what He has promised. There's a reward that is yet ahead. There's a reward that's yet ahead. We look at this verse. Remember, we looked at this last week, and I'm, I'm going quickly. I'll give you more later. Look at this Christian sandwich, okay? You ready? Look at verse 1. Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Do you know what that is? That's the bread on one side. That's salvation. That's when you got saved. Okay? Look at verse 2. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand, and we confidently rejoice in the hope of sharing God's glory. What's that? That's the other part of the sandwich. That's one day in heaven. It will be worth it all. We will see Jesus. He will wipe away every tear. But beloved, sandwiched in between these two wonderful pieces of Christian bread is verse 3. And it says, we also rejoice when we run into problems and trials. Oh, Lord, I want a different filling in my sandwich. I don't want that. But look at what Paul says. For we know that they produce what? Endurance. Endurance. And endurance produces what? Proven character. And proven character produces hope. This is what we talked about last week. And this hope does not disappoint. Why? Because God pours out His love in our hearts. He pours out His love in our hearts. And so here we have, brothers and sisters, you've been saved, right? You've been saved. Praise the Lord for that. We're going to get to heaven one day. Amen? Amen? But in between those two, we're going to go through this. And it's going to be worth it as we go through this. I'm going to put this in the notes. Uh... Oh, sorry, I didn't put it up there. I'm going to put this in the notes, but our time, we've got just a few more minutes left. And so I'm going to give you a scripture that you can look at and study on your own. Because as we go through temptation, here are your, uh, through troubles, here are your temptations. How many of you have gone through a hard time and you start to get angry at God? How many of you have gone through a hard time and you're angry at the people who are making it hard for you. 
You got it. That's right. It's true. It's true. God will give you long suffering. That's what you have with people. Long suffering is with people. Patient endurance is with the trouble itself. It's those two things. I invite you and then I encourage you to go to Psalm 37. And we're not going to take further time on it this morning. Write it down, folks. If, if you have been tempted to anger at people or at God. And the Lord spoke to me this morning. Uh, this was just in my morning listening. I had been, my spirit has been distressed and disturbed over Hong Kong, as many of us have been. And this morning I got up early and I just thought, Lord, I need, I need you. I need, and, and this is one of the things that I was listening to. And verse 8 says, stop being angry. <laughs> but I want to be angry. <laughs> right? What does it say? Turn from your rage. Do not lose your temper. It only leads to harm. So if you have anger in your trouble and in your trial, it's going to, it's going to bring harm. It's going to bring harm to you. And it may, may bring harm to others as well. So watch out for anger in your trouble and in your trial. Okay, so there's one. And I'm going to keep on going. Okay, so there's one temptation. Here's another temptation. How many of you... <laughs> You had self-pity <laughs> when you went it. How many of you? You felt sorry for yourself? Y'all yes. are so spiritual. <laughs> Thank you, Jean. She said, yes. All of us have struggled with self-pity, right? Yes. It's hard for me. Elijah struggled with self-pity. He runs in the wilderness. This is after he'd killed all the prophets of Baal. And he runs away in fear because Jezebel says, I'm going to get you. And he runs away and then he comes before God. And what does he say? God says, do you know that God never attends our pity parties? Did you know that? He, he never comes to any pity party. God says, Elijah, why are you here? What does Elijah say? He says, I've zealously served you. We say that sometimes too. I've been a good Christian, God. But the people, they've broke, all, I tried to help them, but they've done this, this, this. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. I, I, can, I mean, there must be a banner with that. Elijah's pity party with a cake and candles. And when you see this, and what does God say to his pity party? I have 7,000 people that are not serving Baal. You're not alone. As so I want to say to you, please, and, and if I've offended you, I apologize. I, it is not my intention to offend. But what I want to say to you is this. There's a temptation to self-pity. There always is. And God gives us an example so that we don't give in to self-pity. Because self-pity will drown you. It will drown you. So don't, so, so let God help you climb out of that. And then, what else? The Lord says, there's 7,000 people, go back the way you came. And he gives him an answer. As we come, in the, just in the last about three or four minutes now, some of us, when we go through trouble, here's the other temptation, we feel like I'm all alone, God doesn't see me. Nobody sees what I'm going through. I was so encouraged as I look at this. You go all the way to the book of Revelation, and what does God say? Um, what does God say? He says to the church of Eph Ephesus, I know all the things you do. I have seen your patient endurance. I've seen it. I've seen it. If you are enduring patiently, God's eyes are upon you this morning. And then he says to the church at Thyatira, this is the message from the Son of God. You see, brothers and sisters, we can sometimes get encouragement from other people but what I want you to see is this your greatest encouragement in your trouble is that God's eyes are upon you he knows what you're going through and God says God says I can see your patient endurance be encouraged by that and this is one of my favorite verses as well. I know we're going quickly, but in Genesis 39, it's the story of Joseph. And in the last week, we'll come back to him. But here's Joseph. Oh, if anybody went through hard times, years and years and years, mistreated, alone, in a pit, in the prison, you know what it says? It says, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. At the lowest point, lowest point of Joseph's life, God says, I'm with you and I love you. 
So I want to say something to you this morning. Please listen and please receive this. Are you at the bottom of the pit right now? God sees you. God loves you. God is with you. Can anything separate you from the love of God? <coughs> Nothing can. Overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Here's the rest of the verse. Here on this earth, you will have many trials and sorrows, but take heart because I've overcome the world. How do you stand? What do you step on? You're not strong enough. But Jesus overcame the world. And what does Paul say? Overwhelming victory is ours through Jesus. He's with you. I'm putting it there so you can read it for yourself. Read this passage in Romans 8. I'm sorry, I know I'm going fast, but you know these passages. So you can look them up. And here's where we end this morning. What kind of God would our Lord be if he said to you this morning, hang in there, grit your teeth, you can do it, without knowing what we have experienced and what we're going through. What kind of God is that? A bad God. But he's not a bad God. Hebrews 12. Since we are surrounded by all of these others, these witnesses to the life of faith, let us also run. What does it say? It says, let's strip off the weight that slows us down, the sin that trips us. Here we go. Let us run with endurance the race that God has set before us. How are you going to do it this morning? How are you going to endure? Beloved, lift your eyes this morning. Keep your eyes on Jesus, the one who is the source and who also perfects our faith. Because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. And there he is. He's in heaven now. Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary and give up or lose heart. How did Jesus make it through? For the joy set before him. How do you make it through? For the joy set before you. What was his joy? I want to encourage you with this we close. May I say to you this morning that you are his joy. You are his joy. For the joy set before him. Do you think Jesus had such a low view that he was just saying, I just want to make it through this cross so I can get back to heaven where I am worshipped as God and, and the angels adore me? What kind of God is that? The joy set before him was the reward of his endurance. And the reward of his endurance is you and it's me making it, making it. And so if you're going through a trial, or a trial is ahead, lift your eyes up this morning and look at Jesus. And this is how we'll make it. Amen? Amen. Let's close in prayer this morning. Hallelujah. Lord, this morning we pray for ourselves. And Lord, I pray for everyone who's here this morning. And Lord, I pray especially for those this morning that are struggling with this, that have been going through and trying to endure trials that just haven't stopped. They've just kept on going. Lord, this morning, may your people lift their eyes to you. You began this good work in them. You will finish this good work. Jesus, may your people feel and experience and know your joy in them, your love for them, your delight for each child that is seated here this morning. You have promised in your word that you pour forth your love into our hearts. Would you pour forth your love right now? 
Strengthen your children to go through whatever trials they face right now. May not one fall away. May not one give up. May not one turn aside. May not one of us give in to all of those temptations that would waste our troubles. We don't want to waste them. We want to make it through. Thank you, Jesus, for your help and your hope and your strength that we will make it through. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.